Hey there, heretic investigator or 5-1 profile in human design or someone who loves a 5-1 or someone who's just interested in human design. Today I am so excited to share with you a very rare opportunity, I think it's really the first opportunity, to meet someone who is an amazing example of a 5-1. His name is Rory Evelyn, and he is someone I've known for 22 years. He's a very dear friend, and like many fives, he is not to be found on the internet. He, this is his, I think, first widespread appearance on any kind of social media platform. And the stories that he is going to share today are things that I have known about him as a friend and that have really informed my understanding of the 5-1 profile in a practical application, but that I haven't been at liberty to share in a public platform until now. If we haven't met yet, I'm Karen McMullen. I work with entrepreneurs to help them get very clear about who they are and what they're here for using human design and channeled guidance. I share all that here on my channel and I'd love for you to subscribe and even share this video if you haven't already. Without further ado, please meet my dear friend and incredible inspiring heretic investigator Rory Evelyn. Hi, I'm Rory Evelyn and I live in Calgary, Alberta. I work in the mountains as a avalanche forecaster and a ski patrol. So I look after snow stability and injured people mostly. Um, I have a background in history. I love history and I collect 19th century photographs of indigenous cultures, specifically in my area, so that I can find my place in the span of history that we're part of. So I'm going to interject my kind of observations and how I view Rory as a as a 5-1 throughout the video. And if you love Rory and you love this video, you're definitely going to want to check out the video that I did, the full length video about the 5 and the full length video about the 1, because that's where I share the in-depth answers that he had to the official interview questions. In this video, it's more him sharing some incredible stories that illustrate him being a 5-1. Well, for me to be an investigator for human design is, it's my way of sharing who I am. It's the voice that speaks inside of me. It's like my spirit. And, and when I listen to it, that's the message that it gives me. Um, it's like my comfortable present moment when I'm in the present moment. And, and then that's what I hear. That's my calling to go and be nosy. I've always called it being nosy and poke at everything. <laughs> Can you share maybe about the pound maker and how you investigated that? Yeah, I can. Um, pound maker is a indigenous Cree chief who um, I was influenced by when I was eight years old in elementary school, we did a social studies program. And I was so taken by this individual and the struggles in his life and um, the dichotomy of, of who he was. He was he was a really a defensive person, but he's also the protector of his people too. That started me going around asking everyone because I wanted to have something tangible that I could feel asking people if they had an original photograph of Chief Poundmaker. And I did that for about 20 years until I uh, found the photo that I wanted. But it came about in, a, in an unusual way in that I met someone in New Zealand who said, wouldn't it be neat to have a real photograph of these indigenous cultures, like someone that you really care about? And I thought, yeah, I remember doing that when I was a you know, when I was younger, when I was a kid trying to find this picture. So I went back to Canada and um, went on a search. And when I started to search, I um, immediately found an undocumented photograph of Poundmaker. And 
I said, oh, that's Poundmaker. That's the person I want the picture of. And so I bought it. And the owner didn't know what it was. I had heard a decade before that this photograph existed. It was somewhere in the Midwest of the United States. And I saw this photograph and realized, well, this must be this picture that I'd heard about. And um, so I got it and was surprised that no one would accept this photograph as Poundmaker. So I got in touch with his family and uh, they accepted the photograph as Poundmaker. And, and that was really nice for me to have that, that connection and to do all the research that came along with it too. It was fun. It gave me a sense of place for myself too. It was the first validation that what I was doing was really good for me and made me feel good. I have three photographs of Chief Poundmaker. Two of them are, have not been seen before. This is the picture that I found that was undocumented that I had to contact his family. And then they realized that that is definitely Poundmaker, but it's taken from a really early time. And then the picture that I was looking at in school that I could never find is this image. And this is the, this is the photograph that took me 20 years to find. And uh, the person I bought it from, it was his favorite photograph. And I explained to him why I wanted to find it and what it, my intentions were. And that's the, um, the person that was connected with the band who sang the Wounded Knee song, uh, Johnny Cash's band. It was his, um, a friend of the guitarist that I was talking to on the phone that, that had that picture. So those, those were special. And I really liked the connections I got. That was like mm, kind of an emotional experience, I think, to, to share some of that stuff just from the connections. Yeah. The, influence that that first photograph had in the collection and then the subsequent kind of growth from from that point with um the hundred i've had an intention to create a hundred photographs of um indigenous people specifically within a hundred kilometers of, of my area but it started because i was looking for a pound maker and along the way i would find another photograph of someone who lived here what i did is i i spent many hours going through library and digital collections of photographers in this area. And I have a good memory for that sort of stuff. So I scrolled through these things and I'd spend sometimes as long as I could, sometimes an hour or two a day. And I'd memorize uh, specific clothing, hairstyles, beadwork, uh, background, vegetation, designs on other things in the background, whether there's carts, all of that sort of information was compiled so that what I could do when I'm looking for pound makers, I can identify all the other photographs that are not in the correct context, that are out of context, that are misidentified, and I can bring them back into context and give them back their history their spirit by saying, this is the person in the photograph, this is what it was taken, um, this is the tribe they're associated with, and, and all of that, and just built a, a really big picture. And that, even though I found the first unknown photograph that was of that person, it did take another 20 years of searching to actually find the one that I was looking for when I was a child. Some of those connections that are built, I think, have been life-changing because it's questioned what is science and, and if there's not other energies that can you can connect with sometimes. There's some unusual things that have happened with the photographs, even though they're just pieces of paper, of course. That's amazing. I think it's so magical to hear the level of detail that Rory as an investigator is attuned to when he is investigating these photos and how he can really perceive so much. I think that is really a characteristic of investigators. So what I've done with these photographs is I've put together a book and it's, it's my story of all of the quotes and remembrances of the people that were there. So for the indigenous people, I've, I've gone through all the archives that I can access. Um, I've asked permission from certain families to use their quotations to bring these photographs to life. So I've used um, 100 Indigenous images and, and probably 75 European images to create a story about a specific point in time. And that point in time is from 
1870 to 1900. And the significance of that is that it's a tr transition from indigenous culture, a nomadic culture that was just beginning to be influenced in, in my area by European forces. The transition of freedom to reserves to in Canada, we have the, the Real Rebellion that was a great oppression upon the Indigenous culture. And then the formation of residential schools and completed with the railway traveling across Canada in 1885 that actually did away with a lot of the trails, uh, allowed heavy machinery and industry to be transported and located for profit for farming and, and uh, mining and, and other industrial pursuits that were so important to European people and just the significance of that change on the Indigenous culture. And that's why I focused on that time and on this area that I live in. And it all came about because as a child, my family's best friends were Indigenous. And um, I grew up with all the cowboy and Indian stories. And it was a challenge for me when I'd meet our Indigenous friends to have a connection with their past because it was difficult for them to talk about and uh, some of the information had been lost and, and I, wanted, I wanted to bring the stories that I'd heard when I was growing up alive. The name of the book is The Railway and the Indians. What I love about this pound maker story is it really shows how the investigation for an investigator can last a lifetime and that just the process of investigating one thing you know for Rory it was this curiosity about Poundmaker it led to an entire body of work that he created over you know 20 plus years of collecting all these photographs and compiling them into a book. Karen has asked me to share a story about someone whose photograph I discovered that led me on an unusual journey of, of discovery. Um, it is a person that is associated with snakes, so that might not be for everyone, but it is a story that's very important to, to me. What happened is sometimes I only find one or two photographs a year. And one day I was thinking, I'd really like to find someone who is an individual that I've never heard of before, that it was someone who was extraordinary. And um, I was looking in an auction and I found photographs of, of this individual here. And he's holding a rattlesnake. And um, he's a medicine man who was a chief. And his, his English name that he's known by is, is Calf Rope. And in my mind, when I think of these people, the, I always find their Indigenous name, their Indigenous adult name. And in my mind, that's what I call them in my head. But I think it's best just to use the, the English names for them in this case. So Calf Shirt turned up as a New Mexico snake charmer. But I can tell by what he's wearing and the design on his moccasins that he's a Blackfoot. And that's all I knew. And then I researched who it could be holding a rattlesnake and found out that it's a, a really unusual character who, as a child, his family was murdered during the whiskey trade. And um, in a state of depression, he wandered into the, the sand hills to a very dry, arid area for a vision quest. And when he had his vision, he saw an individual walking towards him. And he said, oh, thank we found you. And we're your family. We're the rattlesnake people. And he was told that if he was willing to be adopted by them, that he would, they would be his protectors and his guides. And um, Calf Shirt was initially scared of, of rattlesnakes, but this was a human form that introduced itself, and as many animal spirits do in these, these tales. And he um, accepted this assistance from the rattlesnake people and for the rest of his life he was able to communicate with rattlesnakes and they're his spirit helper so he um, would pick them up and they were his pets because they're his family and he would carry them inside his shirt around his body 
And there's many stories about, he was a bit of a trickster and there's stories about him having the rev, calling the rattlesnakes into houses or having them startle someone, but they're all very innocent things that he ended up being um, a circus performer where he would charge a small price and he would do an exhibit with his pet rattlesnake. It's his family, so he never never harm it or anything. And um, the people were amazed that he could do this. And it's the only person I've found in, in North America that has this story. The unusual thing that happened was it was very difficult to get this information. So I sent down to the United States for a book and it arrived in the springtime, but a month later. And I was really excited to go read who this person was. So I took the book and I went down to the reservoir and I was looking through the book and I'm going through the book, trying to you know, getting to this person's name and I open up the book and I'm like, wow, I finally get to learn like who this person is. He's the chief and what he did with his family and everything. And as I'm reading, I hear this rustling sound. It's kind of faint and it's like the grass just blowing and it becomes more pronounced. And all around me, first I saw one or two snakes, but then I realized that I was actually surrounded by snakes and by some strange happenstance, I had chosen to read this book on a sandstone rock that was on top of a snake den on the first hot day of spring. And uh, all the snakes came up out of the ground and they're all around me. <laughs> I took some pictures of them. Uh, I realized what was going on and I'm happy with them. And I'm reading this guy's story and they're like erupting from the ground. They're like falling off the rocks around me. <laughs> And uh, it was it was quite something to experience. <laughs> and, and I thought, you know, that's that's like his family. And it, it was a really special, special feeling. And um, probably the most profound thing that I've had happen like that. Yeah. So that's my story about about calf shirt and his and his rattlesnakes. Wow. Oh, what an amazing story. Oh, I love that story and wow, it's so profound. As you were sharing it, there was some emotion coming up and I was just wondering what that is for you to be sharing this story. Yeah, I think sharing this story, I, I, I don't share it often and I'm not concerned with how people take it. But when I do share it, I think the emotional part of it is something that... Um, I really wait for the right time that I feel that I can express it concisely and in a way that I want. Because sometimes I do get tripped up in it. I remember when it first happened that I was kind of blown away and I kind of feel like crying sometimes. And I, I still don't know why. But that wasn't the only part of that story because the next week, this photograph came up, which is the third photograph that goes along with those other two in another auction in the States. And then two weeks after, captured's two brothers photograph showed up mysteriously out of contact. And because I'd been researching calf shirt, I saw his brothers and I was like, oh, I, I know that guy. That's, you know. And uh, so his family kind of came to visit and they, they live together in my, in my folder here. That is amazing. And just so you can clarify for people watching, can you explain how you get these things on auction? Like you, you go like, cause even the fact that you got these photos is a miracle because the way that it comes up on eBay is you have to like click the button at the exact moment. And like so many other people are buying it at the same time. That's right. Yeah. Many of these photographs are bought at auction. Um, the interesting thing about images from my area is that they don't, exist here. They're all for tourists. All of those images were made for profit. Um, I think the stories of the people is more important, but it's super important to have the context behind them. So I search all over the world, in Germany, in um, the Midwest of the United States, different parts of Europe. And usually I, I use intuition for how I'm going to purchase these. Some of them come from eBay. I mean, that's just how it is. There's a lot of amazing things on eBay. So I'll very patiently just wait my time and decide on a, on a price that I can pay for these and go and build up my anxiety and then just press the button when the, when the time comes. Um, sometimes I do all sorts of odd things. Like I've created addresses in other countries so I can have things sent that people won't send to other places. I, I go to quite a bit of effort just for my own amusement and, and sense of well-being with 
finding stuff. And I like to share with other people too that have images that are not associated with me, but I have information about them. I think that's important to, to let them know who those people are, where that is image comes from. So it can find a home. Because lots of things don't come up. There's, there's quite a few things here that I've learned about decades ago that are not possible to purchase from the people. And, and you have to be uh, trusted and have some sort of a connection that, that they want to pass these things on. Like I was saying with the pound maker image, it was a really big deal for that guy. I think it took months to, to complete that transaction of him just wanting someone to have something that he treasured, but he wasn't able to really bring it to its right home. And he thought, well, I think this person can bring it to its right home. And that's Poundmaker's family. So that was nice. One of the magical things about the combination of the five and the one is that the five is here to be a hoarder who is basically gathering things. It could be information. It could be collectibles. It could be any kind of object. Um, but you will find if you know a five that they're going to tend to have things that they are collecting and holding on to. You know, one of my friends who's a five one, she is collecting um, tools and all like little screws and hammers and saws. Like she has everything in a, in a very or elaborate organization system in her garage and in her basement so that she's really ready at any moment to provide solution and be the savior. And so the, the five is hoarding and then at a certain moment distributing. I think with Rory, we see how in his process of investigation, like in this story of the calf shirt photo and also the pound maker photo, is that he was able to receive and acquire these photos because he's like hoarding he's getting these resources to then be able to distribute them but he only got them because of the process of investigation and my belief is that five ones are often entrusted with these things because people know first of all that they know their stuff and that they've really become an expert to be able to appreciate what they are actually ha having and then they are entrusted also to then share it widespread. And I have heard this from many people with a five in their profile that they, that they have an easy time acquiring things that have been said to be rare. I love the calf shirt story because it shows also the magic of the process of investigation and how so very intuitive it is. And the, you know, in Rory's case as an emotional manifesting generator, he's following his spidey senses. Um, he does have a defined spleen. Oh, no, no, he has an undefined spleen. Um, but yeah, he's following his spidey senses and his intuition about, you know, where to go, where to look. Well, working with Ski Patrol, I definitely did have a reputation of an odd intuition of showing up for situations that were causing other people anxiety and making it a lot easier for them. I think a lot of it just has to do with I was given freedom of movement. And there is something to say about intuition guiding you towards stuff because after doing this for 30 years, it seems impossible that I didn't end up in some places without um, some sort of unconscious force guiding me there. They some of them. Um, some of those instances seem to occur, I make choices to go places that I realize are not necessarily choices formed with words in my mind. I just move through through space and, and it's my job to be there for people. And so I'm there for people. I'm not quite sure how it goes about, but it does work quite well. And it's really rewarding for me. I, I love I love those stories. Like they they mean the world to me. They're like, oh, well, that's like vindication that I'm doing the right thing, even though I have no idea what I'm doing. It just, it's just part of the, part of the game. <laughs> there was an unusual uh, accident that had happened where 
it, it wasn't a serious accident. It was just someone that had um, with a leg injury, but the patrollers couldn't find them. And because I work snow safety and avalanche work, I was actually out of bounds uh, doing a snow profile for evaluating the stability of the snowpack. And I was listening to the patrollers looking for this person and they'd gone on all the runs on, on that side of the mountain and they'd found uh, a witness at the bottom and had gone up and the person was like, yeah, they were like yelling here and they still can't find them. And they're like, well, that must be the person that's hurt. And now there's no one there. And so I thought, well, if I come back to the ski resort, um, I just took the most straight line that I could. And I went under the boundary and cut across runs through the trees, bushwhacking and pushing branches out of my way. And it was actually just to get to the lift so I could go back up. And I came through the trees at the spot that the person was laying. And I, I think the reason that they couldn't hear that person is there's just a little bit of wind that had come up and they were in a little bit of a hollow. And um, so I showed up and I said, oh, I found this person. And the other patrollers, although they were really happy that I was there and it had solved this for them, they were actually quite upset because they were like, well, we've been calling, you know, looking for this person for quite a while. Where were you? You weren't on the lift. No one saw you at the top. And so where did you come from? <laughs> and uh, I think someone actually went and looked at my tracks of where I'd come from to get to this point and to, to find this person. And that, that was definitely just a happenstance, but it was intuition because I didn't have to go back there. In fact, it was very inconvenient to take that route back. I could have disappeared and not done anything and ended up on another mountain in five minutes. But it's like, no, no, I sh I'm, this is, there's some reason that I'm, compelled to head back and maybe that's because I'm going to find this person that's so awesome and and you do have a reputation can you share your nickname on the hill and why okay well my nickname on the hill is is ghost and it's because of how I move around and appear in places that are unexpected or people believe or people feel are unbelievable from to be at one point at one time and to be at another point at another time they're like there's no way that you could have gone between that space in the in the time that they perceived that's how I mean I'm like that on the ski hill but I'm like that in life I, I wander everywhere and that's part of me being nosy and that's part of my intuition too is is that ghostly way of moving about I startle everyone all the time too and I don't mean to I definitely show up at a lot of places that I'm not expected. <laughs> so I have that reputation when I'm living at other people's houses as well. I, I don't mean to be ghostly at all. <laughs> I have noticed where skiing around with you, where 97% of the time, if there was a call that came through, you would respond and you would be the savior. Mm -hmm. And a certain percentage of the time that when we were in that same area where the accident had taken place, where you just had this feeling like you shouldn't go. I think sometimes when there would be a call that I could respond to and I wouldn't go, that is more to do with what I feel I can contribute to the situation that's gonna unfold. And if I feel that the people there are competent and that I'm not going to benefit that group, then it's my choice not to, not to go to that. And then there's sometimes that I might have a, a skill or I might have some knowledge that is a benefit. And I recognize that the people in that situation will be welcome, welcoming of that, then I will go. And if there's a situation that's going to cause me a lot of anxiety, and I still know that it's going to be a benefit, I will persevere to convince the people that feel that I'm a heretic, that what I'm presenting is correct. And in those situations, it's all about the person that I'm helping. And I take the consequences of some baggage that I might carry around from other people's responses to me as part of the deal. Amazing answer. Thank you. I remember talking to one of the ski patrollers who said that the moment that you arrive on scene, that he just felt so relaxed, like, oh, Rory's here, thank goodness. The five protects themselves 
from being burned at the stake by really following their strategy and authority. And I think that it's so inspiring to see how in his ski career, Rory has really listened to his own body and allowed his body to guide him to be in the right place at the right time and to follow his instinct and his feeling about where he needs to be so that he does protect his reputation and only get involved in situations where he can actually be the savior. Over the course of his career, Rory has saved, <laughs> saved um, upwards of a thousand people on the ski hill. Some of them actually saved their lives and others just made their um, injury more comfortable. And this is, you know, the five is known as the stranger of consequence. So I, I really see how, um, you know, in general, Rory likes to really keep to himself, but on the ski hill, he interacted with so many different people. And he was a stranger of consequence because he came into someone's life at a moment of incredible vulnerability where he was able to really help out and they won't forget him. Um, he might forget them because he has helped so many people, but they won't forget him. Living in a projection field where people are constantly have expectations of how I'm going to provide a solution for them can be a little bit confusing because it can come out of left field. Sometimes it's really well structured that people are like, oh, okay, this is this person for whatever reason we've decided to go along with um, him finding a solution for this. But sometimes they don't really want me to find a solution, but they include me. And then they're a little bit disappointed that I'm the one that comes up with the solution. It, it seems odd. <laughs> I know I'm in the right place, but the people are like telling me that what I'm doing is wrong. And it's like, well, why did you ask for my help? <laughs> so, uh, I think there's a specific story that goes with that. <clears throat> there, there is a, a little one. Um, some of the work that I do is with high angle rescue and you work with fittings that climbers use to ascend and descend uh, certain situations. And some of them use little bits and pieces that we're not as familiar with and they're technical. So we put together a system that was not supposed to come apart. The guy who did it, um, he was put himself in a position of authority and he did this thing and then realized that it had been assembled incorrectly. And the consequence of disassembling it was a part that was worth $180 on a set of 20 of these harnesses that had been set up. And um, they had apparently been trying to figure out how to get this one little piece that looked like they could disassemble it, but they couldn't get any tools into it. They couldn't uh, unscrew the fitting because it had been thread locked. They couldn't apply heat to it due to damage to the aluminum. And they'd been working on it for a couple of days. And then they called me in and they're like, here, Rory, you know, you, you can have a go at this because we're, we're not getting anywhere. And that was one of those situations where I came and I started looking at it and I was immediately told that I wouldn't be successful at it. <laughs> you're kind of like yeah you're the last ditch you know we'll bring you in because you figure out things sometimes but this time you're not going to do it you're not going to pull this one off <laughs> and uh what it was is that one of the pieces that they were trying to unscrew if you applied a force to it to deform the metal just a little bit like it's spring steel you could take you could take it apart and um, they had already cut one of these pieces and damaged the expensive part that they didn't want to and they were so unimpressed that my solution was really really simple it, it works out in the end but it's not always accepted at all it's not just like oh great you know here here it is there's always a little bit of begrudgingly like grumbling that goes along with it <laughs> I feel like that has to do with being a heretic because, you know, like I said, the definition of the heretic is someone that's sharing like a non-common truth, like something that people don't want to readily just embrace mm. the, um, the truth of the heretic. So you're sharing something that's like out of kind of out of the ordinary. That I love. I really like doing that now that I think about it. <laughs> I can see how I'm viewed as a heretic, but I really, that's a really good place for me to be often. Five ones end up knowing a lot 
about a lot of things. And I think that this story about how Rory was able to like manipulate the metal to find a solution is exactly an example of the one, the investigator knowing a bunch of things about a bunch of things, combining with the five, you know, the one who's here to be the savior and provide solutions and how those come together and then he does have the solution. So if you love Rory and I mean, how can you not love Rory? He's so amazing. Um, you can let me know if you need or want to be in touch with him and I can put you in touch with him. Uh, you can reach out to me through my Instagram or my Facebook. If you do send me a Facebook request, make sure you write me a note because I get a lot of Facebook requests and I tend not to accept them. <laughs> and definitely check out those longer videos where he shares his actual official interview answers about being a 5-1 because those are amazing answers. Feel free to reach out to me for a human design reading or a channel reading if you would like to get more clear on the codes that reveal who you are and what you're here for, as well as channel messages from the Council of Light that reveal the energetic signature of your essential self. If you know a 5-1, please share this video with them. I'm sure it will be like a tremendous relief for them to see another example of someone like themselves. I'd love to hear your observation and anecdotes below. And I can't wait to connect with you again soon with more human design and channel content. Okay, see you later. Anything else? Any other stories you want to share that come to mind? I'd just like to have a story that's not about hurt people so much. I hope we go skiing again soon. Yeah, that'll be super fun. Bye.